Yeah. So perfect. So everybody, this is my good friend Tom Miramontes of Mirar Partners. He's a friend of mine. He's a life coach. He's a retired fire chief and a fan of Brene Brown. That's fair to say, right? Oh yeah, and then yeah, right. <laughs> um, well, very cool, Tom. So I'm really happy you're here because I knew I wanted to do this book. It's Brene Brown's newest, right? Dare to Lead, mm-hmm. and um, like I just I wanted to have a guy to do this with, right? Because in our culture, we, uh, like everything, so Brene Brown's a shame and vulnerability researcher. And in our culture, there seems to be this, I don't know, idea or norm that it's okay for, like, it's more okay for women to be vulnerable. It's not okay for men that it's, it's a, a sign of weakness and all this kind of stuff. So I thought if I just came at this with a bunch of women talking about the book, it wouldn't be nearly as powerful. So I'm really excited to have your perspective on all of this. Um, yeah, I think of you as a guy's guy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't even know what a guy's guy is. I just picture you being one. <laughs> I know I do. I live a pretty sheltered life. <laughs> uh, uh, so thank you, uh, Catherine, for mm-hmm. asking me here. I mean, and as we've talked before, I'm just... Uh, a huge fan of Brene's work and mm. is truly her Daring Greatly book is, uh, I tell everybody, it's one of the two cornerstone books of my life that helped me wow. really evolve my life, and put me somewhere. And as you're just saying, and, and I, I think your perspective here of how to uh, talk about the book, about bringing a male, because yeah. when you read Daring Greatly, she talks about for females, there's a multitude of the list of having to be perfect, right? You can't uh, mm-hmm. thin and uh, so body image and you have to be pretty and you have to raise your children perfectly, whatever. And then all this long, yeah. long recipes, you cannot complain about it on top of any of it. <laughs> right. We have to, we have to be able to do it all and look good while doing it. Yeah. And look perfect <laughs> while doing yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. About it, right? Yeah. You may only have one thing and that's weakness. You yeah. can't show weakness. And so you, you tapped on it exactly correct. The way I've seen it and lived it and seen it with other males mm-hmm. is that to be vulnerable is means you're weak and we can't have that. We can't look that way. The culture teaches us to be yeah. strong, right? We fall down as a little boy and nobody picks you up. They say, get up on your own. You got to mm-hmm. deal with it. Now, when uh, a lot of times within the culture, a little girl falls, a lot of people will go to them and pick her up and do those kinds of things yeah and, and share within the pain of even such a simple thing as falling down a lot of us little boys we don't get that what yeah. we get is fall down pick yourself up get yourself going because i i, I can't raise a weak uh, man yeah and so there's a lot to this and i think that piece in my personal opinion is the piece of uh, that keeps where i think men right now are quite confused too as well. I know women are too as well. And we're mm-hmm. in a unique time in our culture with uh, major shifts between men and women and, and all of it. Yeah. And and this is part of what's leading men, in again, my opinion, with the confusion as opposed to embracing the vulnerability, which really taps into a more wholehearted life. And it does Yeah, work. yeah. Yeah, so you've you've seen the benefit, right, of letting yourself be weak, you know, air, total air quotes around that. But I'm really curious, um, and we'll like we'll like this is a little bit outside of the book Dare to Lead, but it's so much so in the realm of what she's about and what her body of work is about that I think it, I would love to spend some time on this. But what what defines weakness for you, coming from that cultural perspective before you were introduced to her work? Um, it's anything I should be able to do everything. And on your own on my own and handle everything mm. so um my father my, i had great parents and so i'm a lucky man mm-hmm. and so and i had a, i came from a loving home and i knew um uh what's the word uh love without any unconditional love yeah so, wow but one thing my father wasn't he wasn't a handyman and i'm not a so like i've, I've had a leak in my shower for like two weeks right and mm-hmm. it's just dripping and finally I, I'm like, I can't, so within my culture head sometimes, well, I can't call anybody. I can't call my brother because then he'll know I don't know how to fix this. Mm-hmm. And because that's weakness. 
And mm -hmm. so we'll look it up on the YouTube. Maybe you can figure it out this way. Maybe you can do it this way. And God forbid I call Moen and ask them, hey, what's going on with the leak? Can you help me? Whatever. Because even these, this great unknown corporation, sometimes I'm feeling, well, I can't have them know. I, I don't know. Mm. And so it's even simple things like that of asking for help yeah. and, and reaching out, as she talks about in the book, re just reaching out and ask. And really, yeah. what's so interesting when I do it, it's, it's people are so generous. They know mm. the judge. And most are trying to help you as much as they can. Yeah. And, and there's such a good feeling with that and being part of a community that's just willing to do that. Yeah. But yet that my first thoughts are, well, I can't tell anybody because then they would know I don't know how to fix this. Wow. Yeah. Like what I just got from that is kind of this, this idea of when women like go down the perfection aisle, right? And men go down the, I'm not going to look weak aisle. They're very isolating choices Yes. because you're perfect because you can do everything on your own. You can do it excellently and you're not weak because you can do everything on your own and you can you know, do it ex excellently or you better be able to do it excellently, right? There's like a similarity right. there that at the end of the day, they're like, by trying to be strong and hide our vulnerability, we end up being alone. Mm -hmm. but, uh, you can much, much so. And even with your, if you're not even alone, when you're with somebody, you're, mm -hmm. you're still isolated. Yeah, right. Because you're, you're not that, not sharing with that yeah. partner or your friend or whoever, yeah. the, the person serve, uh, making the coffee at Starbucks. Mm -hmm. Why not? You're not connecting anywhere within your life, mm -hmm. which means you're isolated. Yeah. And, and, and that is, that's a hard thing to live with too. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, and so we, as she writes in her book, she's like, okay, so we we're living in this perfectionism or this non weakness, but none of us are happy. Right. We're very sad people. We're very uh, troubled mm -hmm. and we try to numb and do all those other things yeah. in order for us to not feel that anymore. Yeah. Like the reaching out is what the vulnerability is the thing that will take you to the good side of where you want to be. Right. Yeah. And, and I mean, in the, in dare to lead, she also talks about how we are scientifically been shown to be social creatures, yeah. right? That we are the happiest. Our well being is the highest when we're part of a social group. And so there's this idea that by focusing on being perfect or strong, even if you're physically part of a social group, you're emotionally very isolated and cut off and you have a lot of consequences that come with that. And then, of course, when you engage in the, the numbing or the shielding behaviors that she talks about, uh, those bring a whole other slew of consequences. You know, a lot of our numbing behaviors aren't great health choices. You know, uh, some of them are fun, but they're not all. <laughs> fun for a while. Yeah, they're not great in the long run. Um, but I, I guess like I can see the negative side really well. Like this is the cost if you're not willing to get vulnerable. I'm wondering what do we get? What do we get for paying that cost? Like what's the benefit, do you think, why we keep choosing the, the perfectionism and the strength? Great question. Um, and it's something I've been, I, I just... I think I've just been tapping into uh, reading some books. So I read the book *Sapiens*, mm. uh, the author's name. So it talks about our why there are other Homo type, Homo sapiens, and Homo erectus, other types of humans. Mm. And just like there's many different types of birds, or spe I, I always forget the, the species. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so somehow only Homo sapiens survived. In fact, Homo erectus or Homo, now I can't remember the other one. They've we have the Homo sapiens haven't even tapped in to the millions of years that they survived prior to Homo sapiens coming around and then prior. Wow. And so wow. part of it is just our DNA. We are just built this way as males and females, right? Where uh, males are trained to be the hunter gatherers of old things. So we, we talk about being in the order. So males are very, generally males are very, um, um, very relaxed. Once I know where I am in the order, it doesn't mean I have to be the leader of the pack. I just mm -hmm. want to know where in the order I fit. Mm -hmm. and, so, and that's fine. So like when I joined the fire department, I knew I was at the bottom of the rung of the pack. I mm -hmm. was fine with that, but I knew where I was at. Mm -hmm. And believe me, they told me all the time. <laughs> yeah. So, so and, 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 and then females gathered together um, in the community part because the males would go hunt and do those right. things. 
And so there's a lot of things with all that. And then the other book I've been reading, so some of it's just DNA stuff, I believe. Mm. And then the other book I've been reading is called Hardwiring Happiness. So our brains, as homo sapiens, our brains are wired to look at things negatively and act on mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the, the, the homo sapien that looked at it like bright and sunny and didn't think about the lion around <laughs> the corner got eaten by the lion. Yeah. And so we are hardwired to look at things negatively. We are hardwired to act upon those kinds of negative thoughts and impulses. Yeah. And you have to hardwire. So the wiring is there. It's just not the default is the negative wiring. Mm -hmm. And you have mm -hmm. to work on that. Um, the positive wiring within yourself to, to feel gratitude, to let it absorb yourself. Let the happiness get absorbed in your and it'll create those pathways in your brain, and then it's it moves into your behavior and becomes okay. easier to tap into. Wow, there is so much in there. Uh, I'm so I'm so happy you could bring in these other books because it really seems like it may like if if there is a gain we get for not going into vulnerability, it's a sense of safety. It sounds like a sense of security. Um, so even though we're not happy, we feel safe That's being right. unhappy. And there is a benefit to that. On top of that, you're talking about not just what we gain, but just the reality of our brains. Mm -hmm. That if we want to, that in other words, to, go, to lean into vulnerability, like Brene Brown is encouraging us all to do, requires us to get, re like, like, it's like working out. Like, we have to be willing to go through the slog of developing neural pathways that are new and that are counter counter to our natural wiring that we're all born right. with. So it takes a real sense of effort and work and consistency probably over time. Because and correct, and that's exactly how I feel with it all too. Because you, you think about even the basic of people like in my my, my father's eighty eight. He turned mm. eighty eight on Friday. He was born in nineteen thirty one. When wow. he was born eighty eight years ago there was no guarantee, there was not this uh, abundance of food supply like we have now. Yeah. And so literally every day was about finding food, right? Even when, even in 31, you think about it. That's amazing. Before, yeah. Yeah. So our lives, so really the other thing I think of is simple things like the abundance of food. Mm -hmm. we, we are living so differently than all the other millions of years. Yeah. But our DNA has not caught up to the change. <laughs> yeah. So, and then computers and all mm -hmm. the abundance of food. I mean, literally, you go to you get a yeah. nice fast food, whatever, for really four bucks, you can, yep. you can fill your belly. I mean, yeah. it's, it's an amazing period of time that we've lived in. Yeah. And so, uh, to me, we haven't caught up. The DNA, it's going to take generations and hundreds of years for the DNA to shift yeah. that hard wiring, whatever but they do exist within our minds and within ourselves and our bodies. We have the capabilities. We just have to really tap into it. Yeah. But it's just not there. Yeah. There's um, one of my favorite books from like a technical side as a life coach is Learned Optimism by Dr. Seligman. Okay. And he literally shows you like, this is the thought experiment you need to do if you want right. to train yourself to think optimistically. And he right. says that the, by, by much more so than anybody really, uh, any of us like actually think there's a lot more pessimists out there than we're aware of. And right. we tend to overestimate how positive, positivistically, if that's a word, we actually think, right? So it's that same kind of thing. Um, yeah, it, it takes work. It takes work because it's not the default. Yeah. Because the way our DNA has been through all the millions of generations and all that and the way our lives yeah. have been. It just, to me, it just hasn't caught up. Yeah. And I th we as humans now, what we live in, we as homo sapiens now and how we live, want to move that way. We just, it's just not right at the forefront of our mind. Yes. Yes. I'm going to pause for a second and just say, hi, Mrs. Scott Evans. Thank you for, for saying hi. We had some chat action going on, Tom. Very nice. guys. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to... Oh, and that, like, that brings me to this, I think, idea, the reason why vulnerability is so hard, like, in a, like, 
from my own experience, because I, I, I have done a good amount of like just getting uncomfortable and practicing staying, you know, not running and just trying to just ex- experience like fully what it means to be uncomfortable. And what I've discovered in that is whatever I was afraid of, it's just like a paper tiger, right? Like it's, there's nothing really behind it. There's this, almost this, like this illusion, like the, the, the fear is just disproportionate. Um, and I think it's because we are hardwired to survive, right? And we're social creatures. So most of what gives me like vulnerability pangs is the idea of embarrassment right? Where I like lose standing in the eyes of somebody else, another human being. Um, yeah. So it's like, it's, it has to do with like the social connection of my life and what I'm like genetically wired to know I need in order to survive. So I, I think the stakes seem so high. And yet in my experience, like they're really not. Like if, if one social group rejects me, The world is big enough now and I have access enough now to other social groups, right? Like I can still survive and and have connections and all that kind of stuff. And yet our brains haven't caught up with that. Right. Yeah, exactly. And that's how I feel my own personal experiences too with the vulnerability because um, somehow that people actually knowing me is a very scary thing, but it's actually what I'm desiring to have. Yeah. It, but yet it, it's I'm, I'm afraid to show the world me yeah it's and it's been and I I've, I've been transforming myself probably the last 10 or 15 years and this has been a uh, especially with her daring greatly book it's mm-hmm. it's like oh I gotta I have to start hey this is Tom and mm-hmm. this is who I am and either you like the Tom package or you don't like the Tom package that's it <laughs> who couldn't like it <laughs> Uh-huh. <laughs> but I, you know, I find most people do, and you know, in her book, um, she talks about just you know having that connection when you go into like getting your coffee at Starbucks yeah. or whatever, and just and I, I, when I do that, and I've been doing it since um, for about seven years now, wow. it's like it's amazing the feedback I get from that, and just mm-hmm. that human to human connection, and I I love it. I just, yeah. It's so rare that I get a yeah. somebody that just shuts down. It, it happens. Yeah. yeah. But the ninety-eight percent of the other times, they're like, "Oh, hi. Oh, and then they I can tell a dumb joke yeah. or they tell me their day or whatever. It's just a it's a beautiful thing. And even yeah. when it's busy, like I'm um, when you're traveling, those ones are just open. They even then to take a to stop and just like, "Hi, how are you this morning?" Yeah. And they'll go, "Oh, hi." And then it just, there's that whole thing. Yeah. I I really love that. Yeah. And that's like, that's such a good example because like, so my version of that, right. I was like, okay, Catherine, I just need the courage to use their name from their name tag and think, say, thanks, John. Right. Like that was like my beginning point. And I was amazed at how often I would chicken out. (laughs) <laughs> like I, and I would invent these stories like, oh, that's not really their name. Like they're borrowing the name tag from a coworker and then they're going to be like, oh, she's so stupid or ha ha, I tricked her. Right. Like I had this like mess of rejection, like balled up in my head over the stupidest little thing. Um, but so on the one hand, it like, you know, says, OK, so vulnerability is vulnerability. It doesn't matter how like how important or we judge the action. Right. Like if the right. if you're feeling vulnerability, you're feeling it. And like, that's just the reality and it's all the same. It's all very difficult. On the other hand, it also like shows me how easy it is to find opportunities Mm -hmm. to begin to like dip our toes into vulnerability. Right. Right. Like, like somebody's name tag using their name or next time you get on the airplane, you know, actually like connecting with the stewardess or the flight attendant, you know, like these little, these little dips can maybe, we might be willing to move forward there if we're not in other areas of our life. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, I, I think she writes a, a about that, that it's the, the sharing isn't about the death, right? I don't have to vomit my whole life because yeah. that over-sharing is actually one of the things that keep us from connecting sometimes. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. That I share everything in my life. <laughs> yeah. But that connecting on that level, whatever that level is for where we're at in that moment, 
and uh, is, is the appropriate one. And you tapped into something else she writes about where we make up the stories in our head ourselves, right? Yeah. So it's where I, I, I do have to, every now and then I'll go, okay, why, where is this story in my head coming from? <laughs> because generally 98% of the time they're not true. No, I know, right? Yeah. yeah. In, in Dare to Lead, she talks about her husband comes home and uh, she's feeling overwhelmed with all the work and all the equipment she made. And, and then her husband yeah. comes home and says, hey, uh, uh, oh, darn it, we don't have any lunch meat. Right? Yeah, right. So he takes up this story. Oh, he wants yeah. to And then he, they start breaking it down. Like, he's like, what, what story are you telling? Because, yeah. because here, here it is. And he goes, who's been doing the Who's been doing the shopping a lot? Yeah, yeah. That was it. And she goes, oh, yeah. And so it really reinforced that we make up these stories yeah. in our head when yeah. we don't know really or don't ask or don't mm -hmm. share what's really good. Yeah, and I find like in life coaching, I think like 99% yeah. of what I do is help people with their stories. Right. Because it's, it's what we tell ourselves that hold us back more than any external right. reality. Um. Yeah, and even like being that my that's being my profession and that's the realm that I work in. Oh, I'm still a mess in my own head, right? <laughs> like like I think that's just the human condition. And it just so that coaching perspective makes me go, "Wow, like we really just need connection." We mm -hmm. like even people who like dedicate their lives to understanding the stories that we tell, I still need somebody to connect with to like bounce my own stories against to see like where where are they false and they're usually right. riddled with falsities or right. falsehoods the uh and exactly in that connection again like in that book sapiens i mean that's mm -hmm. how homo sapiens survive yeah and from, is yeah that connection about being together so this innate that we all strive for yeah it's because we banded together so once we started kind of living closer together we brought animals in like dogs and things and yeah. then we started sharing our farming and we started sharing the safety of being together in a community yep. and and so of course we we are we yearn for that because it's on our base dna the way i yeah learned. yeah and so we we learn yearn for it but yet our society and our life whatever somehow pulls us apart mm -hmm. sometimes mm -hmm. and that probably happens because we needed it. Like we needed right. that tension in order to survive. Yeah. Right. Like at a certain point, like if, if I can imagine what it was like to be a hunter gatherer, right. And a male that was because you're physically stronger, re you know, you're tasked with killing the mammoth. Well, that's, that's a bad example. Cause that took a team effort, <laughs> but like you're, you know, you're tasked to go out. Like there's a certain point where if you can't do it yourself, like you will starve yeah. and maybe your family will starve. So there, but at the same time, you had to rely on the whole. So there had to be that tension in order to survive. It just doesn't always serve us well, any, or it doesn't serve us nearly as well as it used to. And uh, I had a thought about, oh, so, hmm, what, what did I want to say? It kept coming, I'll, it'll come up again. Um, but yeah, so for people who are, you know, viewing or whatever, if you guys have any questions, just put them into chat and I will keep an eye on it. We are talking about Bernays book, well, really her body of work, but specifically about Dare to Lead, which I guess is a kind of a good segue to focus a little bit more on the book, okay. because what I, what I got from it is it's like, it, it seems like her body of work hasn't like really expanded a whole lot beyond Daring Greatly, um, but she's finding really helpful ways to like in her different books to apply it to yourself, to applying it to resiliency, um, you know, to, and in this book, it's how to apply it to being a leader. And the reason why I thought it was a good book to do on my stream is because I firmly believe that we are all leaders, Right. that just by virtue of being connected animals, right? We have these, we are leading somebody. If we aren't leading anybody, we're at least leading ourselves. Right. Um, so yeah. And it's just, so yeah, her book does go into quite a lot of practical advice. Like she gives you tools and things that you can put into like a daily or weekly practice, which is great. Um, I didn't think we really need to get into too much of those ourselves, 
and maybe just focus more on kind of what we're doing and maybe just when when the opportunity arises apply it a little bit to what it looks like for leadership and i guess um so i'm looking at one of her quotes here and it says our ability to be daring leaders will never be great greater than our capacity for vulnerability so here we have been talking about vulnerability and the benefits of kind of leaning into it as an individual and now we can say, oh, the benefit of leading into it as a leader is because you're capped. Like your skill cap is your vulnerability cap. And why do you think that is, Tom? Um, or do you think it is? Like, do you agree? No, no. I, it's, uh, this book spoke to me as a leader, too, as well. Uh, uh, so much. So such depth. And, um, and that for me, I called my leadership style... Uh, servant leadership but really this is what what she writes about here it, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of the same things and this was when you were fire chief yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so um and so i um it's because to in order to serve people mm -hmm. uh, and the people that you work with you have to have sometimes those hard conversations you have mm -hmm. to you have to be vulnerable which means you're open like hey if you mess up yeah, hey even as a leader leaders mess up and, yeah. and and when you're vulnerable that's what builds the trust with you and, and yeah you, yeah you know? and that's what builds the uh the forgiveness when things don't go great which whichever way between the leader and the group or the group and the leader it doesn't matter mm -hmm. because you built that trust because they you know they're they know where you're coming from you're being so open and honest with them and mm -hmm. that they feel that you're on their team and uh, and the, as the leader, you, you know, I used to say when I was a captain on a engine company, so the in, the captain's the one that's the supervisor over the three other people on, because we, in ours, we had a engineer, the driver, and a, a, a paramedic, and then a firefighter. So I was the captain after a few years, took a test and got promoted. And, and, I, and I learned something where the captain, as the captain, I didn't do anything. Physical. Mm -hmm. It was those firefighters and the engineers. They did it all. It's firefighters pulling the ceiling, whatever. My role was was to talk on the radio, give reports, mm -hmm. and sometimes do these things. And so I really learned I don't accomplish anything without my team. Mm -hmm. I don't do one thing yeah. to put this fire out in the way without my team. My team is actually the ones doing it. Mm -hmm. So why wouldn't you support that team that does all the work that puts themselves out there? And yeah. that they will go into you. And when you talk about, you know, whether it's in the military or a police officer, any of the public safety roles, when you look back to your team and say, okay, we're going to go into that building and go fight that fire and do those things, and they follow you, it, it, there's got to be a lot of trust there. There's got to yeah. be a lot of respect. There's got to be on both sides of the fence about yeah. where we're at. And I would, sometimes people go on vacation, you have new people come in, rovers, whatever you call them. And I would look back to them and say, you're my team today. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be in this. And we are in this together. Because at the end of the day, we're all going to go home. That's the, that's the goal. Yeah. We all go home. Yeah. And so today, you're our, we're the team. And so without me even saying things like that and being open with them, then people I didn't mm -hmm. kind of know or they would have, quote, unquote, bad reputations, I'd say, I don't, it doesn't matter to me. What you come in with today, this is how we're going to do it. Mm. And sometimes if you worked overtime, I'd go to another station and they'd say, hey, Kat, we kind of don't do it like this. This is how we do it. I'd say, oh, okay, I understand what you're telling me. But today, we're, kinda, <laughs> we're going to kind of follow the rules because I was a rule follower. Mm -hmm. And this is how we're going to do it. Tomorrow, have at it. Yeah. We're going to kind of come back to you guys, do however you want to do it. But yeah. today, because, and I only pushed it because if they weren't following the rules, they weren't wearing their equipment and and all that stuff, uh, all the safety stuff, whatever. Yeah. Well, today we're going to wear these things. And so, um, so yes, without all that, having those hard conversations, being there for them, listening. Yeah. And, and instead of me, the one always speaking, I'm like, no, no, my team needs to speak. They, they, need, they need to tell me what they need so I can yeah. help them. Get yeah. Them. And so it, it's, it's, it's what you have to do in order to build it. And she, she wrote it perfectly in the book. Yeah. I, yeah. So 
And I, like, again, like, I'm so happy you're here because in a fire department, right, it's life or death. So the stakes are really high to your leadership, or they're more apparently high, right? Um, so I think that gives us all, like, a nice, like, kind of metaphor because all of our leadership choices are, in a way, life or death, right? They're either going to isolate us from each other or they're going to create those connections, and the connections are what build a fulfilling, meaningful life to a large extent. Uh, I I really went there philosophically, but so what I got out of that story is kind of two things. One is that, that idea of, all right, in a sense, nothing gets accomplished without a team. That's right. And so you're either going to have a team of isolated and fearful individuals that are hiding from their vulnerabilities. And so working independently of each other, trying to create a whole thing sounds like a painful mess. I know I've been in a work situation like that, and it was awful. It just felt awful. Um, fights were much more prevalent, all that kind of stuff. Or you risk vulnerability, and it draws people together, and you can actually build it together, and I think have a much better outcome. And in, in your world, a very real increased sense of safety, a real safety, not just a sense of safety. And the other thing I got was you touched on this like myth we have that Trust comes before vulnerability. When Bernay points out, no, 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 it's vulnerability that builds trust. And I that's t I was like, oh, of course, <laughs> of course. That's totally how it goes. Right? Yeah, like, like people have difficulty getting or building trust because they don't yeah. understand it. And we can be quite unwilling to give that vulnerability. And a lot of new leaders, especially what I see, is that they feel exactly what uh the, the fear, right? The vulnerability. Yeah. So I can't appear to be weak. And so therefore I'm not going to give up the vulnerability when it's actually the opposite. Yeah. And, and the, the respect people give you when you tell them, I don't know, does anybody else know how to do this? When you're at work and doing those yeah. kind of things, it's amazing what happens with that. Yeah. And what we can give you because then it just enhances the team. When this person knows this, we used to go, one of the guys, um, I knew him forever and he was on my crew. And when we go to the fire and it's moving pretty quick, whatever, he knew building construction uh, you know, mm. a thousand times better than I did. And I would get up to him and I'd say, okay, Andy, where where do you think it's going? How's it running those rafters? How's it in this? Can you tell me. Wow. It's, well, built like this and do this. He goes, I think we should. And I go, okay, that's what we're going to do. Yeah. Because it didn't matter to me where it came from. It just mattered to me that we're going to do the best job that we can. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a perfect example of how vulnerability and connection can lead to a better outcome or probably right. most of the time does. Oh yeah, definitely. And, and, and that allowance and being that servant to your crew, right? Mm -hmm. Because again, I didn't giving up that I had to know everything. I would say, I know Andy knows this better than I do. Andy, what, what's this building doing and how long do we have inside? And, and to me, I, you said something about this life or death, whatever. I, you know, I, it's, I, I have such a perspective on that different, I guess, because, mm. you know, for me, I was a firefighter for a long time. And, you know, for us, a fire was just Tuesday. I mean, yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's just what we did. I mean, so it was the work art we did. And whether we went in car wrecks and did all these other things too as well. And so for us, it's just work. And so yeah. when I transitioned and was promoted into the chief's role, and then I went to an office and did that kind of stuff, you know, to me, it was the same work. I mean, you're still developing policies and working out procedures and things that are helping the tools out there. Um, but it, it's not you doing it. It's, you know, it's, it's what I've learned is working with the team and enhancing the team mm -hmm. and keeping the team on track um, in order to do that and being that servant leader. And so I, I used to every morning when I was a chief have a route. So the chief's floor was on the second floor and then uh, the, um, the people that actually did work, you know, like the uh, Italian chiefs who were on the administrative side or the uh, the civilian staff that was, you know, they, they developed stuff or did things. I, I would walk into all their offices every morning. I'd say, hey, good morning. And then my, my thing would be, what can I do for you? Mm -hmm. Because my, my thing was that I was there to take away obstacles mm -hmm. so that they can do their work. And then, or what, what, what issues are you having with this? Yeah. Or what are we where, where are our hitches? Or, great job. Uh, you did this. You got the policy implemented. You did this. You're doing great. Keep yeah. going. 
you're on the right path. And every day, and I and I just did it by happenstance. I didn't really, you know, I just started doing it. Um, and what I found was they would sit there and like, oh, good, I was waiting for you. Huh. Waiting. Yeah. And then like, and so it became the time, I, and I really, it became the time I got to move obstacles. I sometimes I was just mentoring or coaching, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, keeping their, you know, keeping them focused or keeping them, you know, energized and, yeah. and or just sometimes saying, yeah, you know, sometimes working for a city sucks. Yeah. Yeah. Mean, Empathizing, right? <laughs> yeah. And, and then what I got out of it was amazing that I had a, they knew that I would help them remove obstacles if I could. And then on top of it, I knew exactly what was going to be important in all the different yeah. things I walked into it. Yeah, and, but like, great idea, right? Like, brilliant thing you kind of just, in, like, found your way into gut, from your gut, probably. Yeah. Uh, but I can, yeah, somehow, but I can, I can picture, like, two different leaders doing the same behavior. One is the leader that, that leads through blaming and shaming. Right. You know, showing up being like, hey, how can I help you today? Getting, like, crickets in response, right? Or just surface level things versus a leader who's, shown up and been vulnerable before and is building that trust to get the real answers from people. Right. Right. Like that's like, that's one of the, there's just so many benefits we get when we, when we can just lean into vulnerability more and more often that they're just all counterintuitive until you start to live it, you know? And then right. there really does become this dichotomy between a leader who leads from vulnerability and one who leads from armor it's just, right. yeah. Um, and, and even in being in staff meetings or meetings about whatever and saying, and, you know, leading the meeting, and I would say, okay, I have no idea even how to approach this. So yeah. I, I would call it, this is where we throw the paint. Look, we're going to just throw our ideas and then yeah. let's just see which one sticks and maybe we can, and then we'll all agree upon that. Yeah. That has to go because it doesn't matter where it comes from. A good idea can come from anywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a lot of leaders can't aren't okay with that, right? right exactly. Because it feels like a threat to their leadership or to their position right. of influence. Yeah, there's so many common pitfalls, I think, that we tend to fall into, and that would be one of them. Right. Um, but that also, like, picture you going into a meeting and not really knowing where it's going to go and, like, being okay with that is vulnerable. And, like, I, I can picture then myself in that position and I think this is pretty common where I'd want to like plan it out. <laughs> like, okay, I know I'm uncertain. I don't know where it's going to go. So this is what I'll do. Right. And like, I try to create this construct to take the uncertainty and make it certain. And Brene Brown talks about that as a myth, right? That we can't actually engineer the uncertainty or discomfort out of vulnerability. And I think I've probably wasted a lot of my time and energy trying to do that, <laughs> you know, in various forms. Probably very human. And, but it's always, you know, when I first was a leader, uh, the official leader, you know, designated, get promoted and things, I mean, I, I was not very good at it. Mm -hmm. I made a lot, I made a ton of mistakes. And, 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 and as she writes here, right, without those, ex those experiences, yeah. You do truly learn more by erring yes. than by doing it perfectly, right? Or yeah. or pretty uh, effectively. Because I, I remember just, and even watching other leaders watch their behavior, like, I don't know what to do, and I don't know how to lead yet, but I'm not doing that. Yeah, yeah. There's sometimes I watch behavior like, well, at least I know I'm not going to do that. And yeah. so, you know, and that was helpful. But I made a ton of errors. And, and the biggest one I did was not show my vulnerability not having the hard conversations early mm, mm -hmm. and and having those things and mentoring people daily yeah. and just having that good interaction with with another human being and acknowledging them validating them yeah. and then asking them what can i do for you yeah so what is the benefit then of having the hard conversation early rather than putting it off so generally if you have the, the harder conversation earlier it's not as a big of an issue as mm -hmm. if you keep waiting and waiting. Yeah. And then, so it's not just about yourself because you know it. You know it. Mm -hmm. You can feel it. That other person knows it too. And yeah. they can feel it. 
but they're not the ones going to step up. You're supposed yeah. to be the or whatever. They're not going to have that conversation. Yeah. Sometimes they like what they're doing, even though it's against the rules or whatever. Right. And why should they change? But they know. And you yeah. Know. And you know they know, and they know they know. <laughs> and, yeah. And then the, the, the other thing that eats away at the trust with the team or whatever is everybody else on that team knows. They yeah. All they all know. So there's an accountability or integrity piece that can that right. can break up the trust. That's right. It reminds me of like someone who puts off going to the dentist or the doctor, right? They're like, uh, something's kind of off, but I, I, it's, it's, I don't really want to deal with it. And then it's like, oh no, you have to have many, many root canals because you came in five years too late, you know, or now you have like heart disease, right? Or whatever. Like I, Hey, I've, I've been guilty I've of been, doing yes, things like this. I've been on patients where they've, they've had chest pain and they can't move their arm, their left arm for like a, a day and a half. Well, yeah, and they why, still don't go, right? Like, why didn't you call us a day and a half ago? But yeah, just, just, it's hard. It's hard. It's heavy. As, as Brene writes, it's hard to have the same hard conversation with yourself. Yes. Yeah, I right. Know. Right. And, and as judging, like as much of a judger we are of other people, and sh- like the much as much as we shame other people or blame them, we're way worse to ourselves. <laughs> like we treat each other. Yeah. yeah, totally, totally. Um, one thing that I love is that Brene Brown says that daring is saying, "I know I will eventually fail, and I'm still all in." Right, right. I do love that line too. Yeah, like that's. Being all in is my motto for life. Like, it's how I think we can live fully and make the most out of our limited time. And the fact that she just applies it here so directly to vulnerability is so great because it goes against all of those myths, right? And, like, you can't engineer the the certain the uncertainty out of it. You can't, like, trust does build vulnerability. And you, you just have to... And, then like, this goes to, like, how the story you've been laying out about how you were a chief... It's like you didn't know how to be a vulnerable leader, how to be an effective leader. You just went on the journey, right? And you were willing to like fail and still stay all in. And I'm, I'm sure it wasn't like a perfect thing where you were vulnerable, all, like not at all, like it's a learning experience, but that's the point is it's a learning experience. And it's never ending. It's never ending, ever. It's never stopped. And, and it was about... And I love the way you're just saying it uh, about showing up, being present as Brene Brown, right? Yeah. Right? Showing up, being present, and being authentic. Yeah. And in some ways, when I'm able to do that, no matter what happens, I, I never thought of it as a failure. Yes. Hey, I was in and I did my best. Yeah, I yeah. did the best I could. Yeah. And they did, and if they were in and they did the best I could, I was, no matter what happened, I was proud yeah. of what they did. Because we went on horrible, I always remember this one traffic accident, these four people were badly um, trapped in this vehicle, mm-hmm. you know, just the engine showed up, there's only four of us, I mean, there's a lot of work, and, you know, I still to this day, I, I, I never followed up to see if any of them survived, right. because I was proud of what we did, even yep. though maybe the outcome was very right. I, I really don't believe any of them survived, Yeah. the damage was so bad before we got there, but... right. But I was very proud of the work that we did and how we organized yeah. it, called them the resources and the different things that we were supposed to do. Yeah. And so it, it's a, so I, you know, even though we lost lives, uh, you know, I still, uh, I, you know, you feel bad about that. Yeah. But, um, but being prideful of the team, yeah. we worked together as a team and we were efficient and we gave them the best chance. To yeah. Like in a way, it's an illusion that we can get through life without failing. That's right. Right? So you either, you make a choice to fail with authenticity, right? And, and fail in a way that you can be proud of, or you go on automatic pilot and make a non-choice and fail out of fear, right? right. <laughs> it's like, I would rather fail fail and feel good about it right like let's do it <laughs> you know like for, for me i in those times i don't think i ever used the word failure yeah I mean, sure 
I do use that word because I didn't show up. I didn't, I, yeah. I didn't was vulnerable. And then I, I, I use, I, I know what the way I think about it is like, man, I wish it could have turned out different, but I know we did our best. We showed up, yeah. you know, I showed up, we, we showed up, we were authentic. We laid out, we did the best effort. When I was raising, and I think I told you this before, just in our other conversations, when I was raising my daughters, I would tell them um, that we'd look at grades and I'd say, okay. And my kids usually got really good grades, A's and B's. And so one time my youngest daughter came home with a C. She's like, oh, and she just started, oh, dad, you know this and this. And I said, no, 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 I have one question. I said, yeah. did, you, did you try your best? Did you give it some effort? She yeah. said, oh, yeah, dad. I went after school, talked to him. Yeah. So I said, honey, I'm as proud of this C as any of the other grades you've ever done. Yeah, it's so great. I'm prideful of the effort that you showed yeah. and that you went because effort will always get you somewhere. I said, yeah. Yeah. It's okay. You're so timely saying that because Mrs. Scott Evans just said, better to fail trying than to fail from lack of trying, and that she tries to teach her kids that. That's right. And that is exactly what you were just talking about. And so, yeah, I do get it that when when you choose the vulnerable path, right, and you're just you're living authentically, doing all that, like failure, it doesn't even happen, right? No. But you feel like you failed if you've right. done the, the safe route, right? Oh, for yeah. sure, for sure. And you feel isolated and alone and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and like I love that, like, so yeah, like I guess like what comes up for me too is, so I don't know, like I started working directly with my fear and it, when I started being an actress, so this was like 15 years ago, um, and I was always, so I came to understand fear pretty well. And I was like, okay, so I feel uncomfortable whenever I step outside my comfort zone, right? Very simple. And my my only task was just to f start where I'm at, like do whatever makes me slight, like it, it it's, this, it's like the principle in, co in coaching, right? You don't wanna go for something that's so scary that you're paralyzed or something so easy that you're not afraid at all. You wanna find that that middle ground, that slightly of a stretch. So that's what I would do. Like I would dip my toes into my discomfort and my vulnerability and my challenge to myself was just to stay there. Not to numb, not to shield, but just to stay in it. And what I found is that eventually the action that caused me to be uncomfortable, like didn't cause me to be com uncomfortable after a while. Like, right, because I became more skillful or whatever, uh, I, like, my brain understood that it wasn't a real danger. So I was like, yes, I am now safe for the rest of my life. No, that just means I'm more of a badass. And now I, like, now my, my step is closer to that thing that would have been so scary that it's paralyzing. And so, like, in a way, I, I'm really glad life is like this now, but back then I was like, yeah, mother, blah, blah, you know, like I'm always like, if I want to live fully, right. And like become like my full potential and like really show up for the world and give to the world something that only I can give, I'm always going to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Like I will never reach a point where I am not growing until I die. And like, it's beautiful, but oh man, is that challenging? <laughs> well, two things come up for me. Yeah. Yeah. On that story where uh you know that saying but it's true life is truly a journey there's there, there's no there's only one end point and we're all gonna be there but then yeah the journey is over truly is over yeah so it, it, we are just constantly uh if uh, if we if we're not changing we're we're, we're dying yeah right if we're not growing we're growing yeah. and the other thing is when we allow ourselves to allow that fear of failure or whatever we're trying to do or that vulnerability, whatever, of course we're nervous, whatever, but then without that feeling, there's no sense of accomplishment. Yeah, you know, totally. Master, right? So, because like you were saying, okay, now I've mastered it, and then I don't get that feeling anymore. Well, because we know we're accomplished within that. Yeah. Right? And now we search for the next accomplishment, right? And right. The next one and the next one. And that's what expands people that we are and from inside out or yeah. our skill sets or uh, again a continuous us on this journey because then once we allow ourselves to open that window of fear and go through it then, yeah. then I never know what's on really on the other side I know there. I know that's where the adventure of life is right, right. it's in adventure requires it like it to be not predictable 
That's right. Risk. And it, there to be risk. Yeah. And this is a way to, um, like, I always try to differentiate for people that I talk to about this and, like, my clients between physical risk taking, which I have, like, one set of criteria around that's much more cautious, right? And emotional risk taking. Right. And that's where Brene Brown shines. That's where she's teaching us the skills and the attitude, the mentality shift to like go all in on the emotional risk taking. Um, yeah, and she even says that, that fear is not the barrier; it's how we res- it's how we respond to fear. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of what we're getting at. It's like fear is universal; it's yes. never, ever, ever, ever going to go away for you. And that that's okay. Like it can be accepted and in in a way it can be befriended. You know, like I think if I, I've made my best life choices when I've used fear as a guiding, emotional risk-taking fear as a guide. Right. Because I'm usually the most afraid of what's the most meaningful to me. Right. Without, and to me, exactly, without that fear what I do is when I recognize I have that fear about something, then that means it is meaningful. To me. Yeah. That makes sense, right? Yeah. And that means like, oh gosh, when I, and when I realize that I'll go to myself, I go, oh, that means I'll probably get it. I don't want to do it. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it's like, and I have that much fear with it. Yeah. You know, that means it's meaningful. It's my body telling yep. me, please. And I think that's a result of our coaching, right? Like, cause that's what I've experienced as a coach is as soon as, cause I, I'm, I'm also am coached. So as soon as I realize in a coaching session that I'm afraid of something, I'm like, well, now I know what I'm going to do. Gosh, darn it. Um, but we have a question. So Mrs. Okay. Scott Evans asks, how do you identify what would be too much and paralyzing versus what is just enough of a challenge? Great question. Yeah. And I think it's, we, we all have our different uh, levels with that, right? Whatever mm-hmm. they can be, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I know what I do for myself is when I feel that paralyzing one, because I do. Yeah. Um, I really, that's when like using Brene Brown's stuff about, okay, what story am I telling myself that's allowing me to feel mm-hmm. paralyzed? Yeah. And w- what's really going on here? And, and trying to search that. And I also try to give myself, as I've gotten older in my life, more grace. It's so I mm-hmm. acknowledge that I'm feeling the fear, and maybe it's mm-hmm. so paralyzing. Acknowledge it and then validate it. It's okay. Yeah. This happens, and I don't have to do it today, and I don't have to do it tomorrow. Yeah. But I think it is something I want to search within myself to see why I'm feeling paralyzed, mm-hmm. and then what can I help myself get to something? Yes. Where then I'm going to get it because there's there's something there yeah and then the other ones is she, the other layers are just within that right where um you know I was, we were talking uh, last week uh Catherine and i about me taking this yoga instructor class and i'm big in yoga and whatever and i i was telling them i feel like i should go but no i'm not gonna go it's, <laughs> it's fearful i'm like oh, i'm not going then Catherine and, uh, and our other friend said Oh, well, Thomas sure sounds like you want to go, and that, that's mm-hmm. where you need to be. And I went, yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah. And so yeah. just that allowance sometimes of reaching out to somebody else, mm-hmm. a friend, somebody you trust, to get that feedback. Yeah. Because sometimes you can hear yourself too much, and mm-hmm. you need to hear from somebody else. Ah, those are that's so, so good. And I'm so glad you answered that instead of me, because you were basically giving examples of, okay, there's a paralyzing fear in your life that's not going away, right? So maybe it's a tough conversation with a loved one that you know in your heart needs to happen. And so, or with yourself, right? So some of those things are, you can unravel this, unpack the story you're telling yourself because chances are it's not as bad as you think and you're making it out to be. So you take away that, that intensity of the fear and make it much more manageable. And sometimes you can just spit it out at some trusted friends who can, are capable of handling that fear and not feeding it back to you as a monster, right? But actually handling it can really help. Without the judgment. Totally, without the judgment. Um, she says, great points. <laughs> so the, she thanks uh, you. And, and it, it is as simple as so, so some people have uh, quite a fear of water, right? It yeah. Comes- and literally, it's literally sometimes just starting by just dipping your toe. In yes. Yeah. That, yeah. That's enough 
stay and let you stand. Yeah. And those kinds of things. Right. Or water wings or whatever, whatever yeah. it is to help just the, the stair step it through that. Yeah, and that's kind of, that's something I want to bring up too, is that one of the, the beauty of Bernays work is that it's universal. So we can apply it no matter who we are and no matter where, where we are at on our courage building journey, That's right. right? Because the reality is, is even the biggest badasses of us all who are super courageous, you know, feel fear and do it anyways every single time, they're still feeling fear all the time. And so you can, you can just start with where you're at. And um, so if you want to build a practice of courage building in your life, it might be helpful to look at this question of paralyzing, you know, paralyzing fear in the, in the kind of these like classic coaching terms, which would be think of actions you could take that induce fear, right? And then you want to choose the one, the one that you choose to do, I should say, is the one that's somewhere in the middle, right? So it's not so terrifying that you're likely to not do it and then feel like a loser, right? You don't want, you want to protect yourself from our very normal patterns and you don't want to go as one that's so easy that you're not building the courage muscle, right? So you kind of are like picking the, the, the baby, the, the middle, the mama bear, the mama bear choice, right? And that sets you up for success because you're likely to do it and you're also uncomfortable, but not too uncomfortable. Right. So there's different approaches if the paralyzing fear is something you're wanting to create for yourself or if it's something that's in your face that you know you have to deal with but are really afraid to deal with it. Yeah, and I, and, uh, I agree totally. And the and way I also look at it is it's the best one is the one I'm willing to do. And yeah. To get action started. Right? And yeah. Just to get that action started and literally to just be dipping my toe in that one. But that's it. That's enough. And I'll, I'll address yeah. it next. Or whatever, whatever. Yeah, yeah, and there's this, there's uh, definitely in her work and in what you're just saying, there's a theme of self love and compassion. That's right. uh, it's very, very easy to judge ourselves, and if we're setting ourselves up with the challenge to to build our courage and to lean into vulnerability, uh, it's going to be easy to judge ourselves for when we don't do it, or when we feel right. like we've dogged dogged out, you know, or whatever. And that's just, that's just so counterproductive to this work. This is a lifelong journey. And so like she says, vulnerability is not winning or losing. It's having the courage to show up when you can't control the outcome. And I think that that, that just says it so well. Yeah. And that's such a great point, Catherine, where, and it took me, and I'm still not really that great at it, but that self-compassion. Yeah. It's, it's really, and to give... And we were so, it's so interesting. We're so willing to give it to everybody else sometimes, but we're not willing to give it to ourselves. Yeah. And so, and sometimes when I'm feeling that paralyzing kind of fear or some of those things, sometimes I just have to stop and just say, give yourself some grace, give yourself some yeah. time, give yourself yeah. some, let it kind of just, you know, simmer within you. Yeah. And, and then, you know, we can, we can go back and address it. But yeah. I literally say, give yourself some grace here. Yeah. And it's okay. It's okay to be scared. It's okay to have fear. It's okay. It's a, these are natural human emotions. Yeah. It's okay to, to feel like, oh, I, uh, like, a, like I failed. Yeah. And it's okay to feel sad. I mean, it's just yeah. part of life. Yes, yes. And so important because if you don't give yourself the grace to feel what you're feeling without judgment, what you do is you deny what you're feeling. And fear thrives in denial, right? Mm -hmm. Like the, the less light you shine on your fear, the more paralyzing it becomes. So maybe then the, one of the simplest ways to like begin to lean into vulnerability is just to pay attention to the emotions you're feeling mm -hmm. and right. to start naming them. You know, a lot of us, um, maybe, maybe mostly the men too, because of that cultural norm, but a lot of us don't have a great vocabulary for what we feel. And just, just being able to say, oh, I'm eating all my Oreos <laughs> right now because I'm afraid, right? Like, oh, okay. And then I'm less likely to need the Oreos. I could still eat them, but I'm less likely to need them. And sometimes it, it's okay to keep eating them. Totally. If that's the bridge that you need. Yeah. 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 Recognition. 
that I'm eating Oreos because of yeah. that that's where the gold is. Yeah. And then and then the shame and, and and allowance of that vulnerability coming in really start breaking all that stuff down. Yeah. Yeah, I, I and Oreos are good. Yeah, they are they are good. <laughs> I am not sponsored by Oreos. <laughs> Yeah, like if I, 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 I'm so this is this is so exciting to me because I feel like we've we found like a very tangible tip for people, and I I do now think that simply acknowledging what I feel is an act of courage, mm-hmm. and yes. it's a necessary one because if I don't do that, how am I going to share my vulnerability with another human being in order to build connection and trust? Right. right. I guess I could say hey, I'm feeling something and I don't understand it would actually be a great step if you don't know it. But yeah, that, that first step of just learning yourself and how you feel is so important. And if, if you're not doing that for yourself, who else is going to? Nobody yeah. Else. You're That's the it. only one that can do that. And you're That's the it. only one with yourself that you go through this entire journey yeah. with um, of this life journey. Yeah. And so... Without that self-compassion, that self-acknowledgement, the self-recognition, I mean, how are we really then supposed to get it and put it out there? Yeah. Yeah. You know, this is self-help industry and personal growth, responsibility, responsibility, responsibility. Like those terms, it's like, if you want to grow as a person, it's up to you. That's right. Right? Nobody else can live your life for you. It sounds very pithy and trite, but it is so true. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question for you. Okay. So I, I was uh, knowing we we're going to talk about this, going through the book again a little bit, just kind of, and then it talked about millennials. Oh, okay. And so within the millennials, I found this so interesting because I'm not a millennial. Um, what? I'm, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a millennial times two. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> so the, um, and so... What I found interesting is that uh, what she talked about was, you know, and it's not unusual for any generation to not have, you know, the hard conversations and some vulnerability and some empathy and all those mm-hmm. other things they talked about. But, but what I found interesting, but then they, they also said, but they've always had help using technology. Mm. And within this realm, technology doesn't really apply. Or I, I guess that's my question. Ah. Is that really accurate? Because they're used to having some sort of technology assist within a millennial within their lives because that's what they grew up with. Yeah, right? yeah. And so is that really accurate? And then yeah. and really a, a space for maybe for all of us to learn. So in other words, is there, as a millennial, have I found a technological outlet for vulnerability and connection? That and leadership and, and leadership. all these other human types of things that yeah. I think human interaction. Because I think there still has to be human interaction. Yeah. Some- yeah. So I think yes and no, mostly no. Okay. Um, y- yes in that the internet has all the answers, right? Like I just Google everything. So if I'm feeling, if I can identify my emotions and my experience, I can find somebody's story through video or whatever that like humanizes what I'm going through. Oh, okay. Right. So, but that takes a huge, huge self-awareness on my part to do that. So I don't think a lot of people do that. Um, but in, in the larger sense and like, you know, Ted talks are great for leadership and like big think and that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of wonderful content out there. But by and large, we were raised on social media. And that's a dis- to me, that's a disconnecting medium. And it's very counterintuitive. The promise of social media was that we would feel connected as humans. But I, that hasn't been my, like my experience until Twitch, which is why I'm on Twitch. Because it is a social media platform but the way it's set up is we actually build very real communities with our viewers and we have like a fantastic chat system where they can participate and I can participate and like you actually form real bonds and share real experiences. So it can be done. Um, it just kind of isn't. And 
at the same time, like it makes me, I, I think Brene Brown talked about how from her perspective, her research perspective, the disservice that millennials have gone through is that our parents protected us too much yeah. and that we would get like awards for trying, right? <laughs> and, like awards for everything, just whatever, like just awards, 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 awards. So that when life is a struggle, which it is by nature, we kind of complain or we don't know how, we don't know how to handle adversity. Um, I had a hard time reading that. I, I trust that she's based it on research, mm -hmm. but I personally, that's not my story. But I, you know, I grew up in a, a family that was divorced when I was 10. My dad came out of the closet. I, you know, like very understandably, like was, resp like, I, I just kind of, like, it wasn't good, right? Like in my family for a while. So emotionally, I kind of like had to pick myself up and be responsible for myself and struggle through a lot of adversity early on. Um, so like, I don't feel like I had like a coddled, protected childhood, right? right? Just cause that wasn't the cards we were dealt as a family. Um, amazing family, super loving, just everybody was hurting, you know? So I don't know if that's true for my generation as a whole, um, but I, I, you know, we get a real bad rap out there <laughs> for sure. And I assume some of it might be justified, but on the whole, I think my generation's awesome. <laughs> no, but, I, mean, too. I think every generation is awesome. Yeah, because totally. From my perspective, because, you know, I was in the fire service for 33 years, and so yeah. you know, millennials were, uh, are obviously there and having an impact, and people talk about, complain about, you know, this, they're different, whatever. And I said, well, yeah. here, here's how I look at it. When I came into the fire service, I remember I brought in a, there was no gyms in the, little home gyms in the stations or anything nobody would wow run. so i would bring a jump rope and i have my little pad and i i would jump rope so i'm this 23 year old kid jump roping for an hour with on the bay floor and yeah. literally the older firefighters would be leaning smoking their cigarettes <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah right smoking, smoke at me as i'm jumping rope and they'd be saying, <laughs> what are you doing i'm like well i want to stay in shape i want to work yeah out. healthy and fit they're like you're young you're healthy and fit look at me i'm not healthy I'm not right rope I'm not jumping rope. <laughs> yeah. So I'm sure they thought my generation was weird. And mm -hmm. that's it. Mm -hmm. I had all Always. these problems. And God forbid that uh, my generation did so. Guess what? My yeah. generation took over and became leaders and did these things. Yeah, yeah. They also do the same thing. Every generation will. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I think um, we just to get to have our time within those impacts with each yeah. generation. And then and then we get each generation gets to shift the world. And it's a yeah. beautiful thing. And that's what yeah. makes the night. Yeah. So, so well said. I, so like this brings up for me the term helicopter parenting. Yeah. Right. Which I have, I have seen a good share of with, you know, the, okay. the various babies around in my world right now that I'm in my thirties, there's quite a bit of them. Um, so that's fascinating to me because I, I look at it, I try not to judge cause I am not a parent. Right. right. <laughs> but of course I judge. <laughs> Really, I, it's so hard. I'm no, no doubt there, but I always wonder, like, ooh, like, like, cause, like, I also grew up on the edge of a national forest, and like, I was always like, I mean, this is from when I was like five to ten on my own in the forest, right? Just playing around and like going and like, like, I just, I was treated like there was no real danger in the world in a way. And um, I think that served me. So I just wonder, I, I just do see that there's a lot of fear about our environment now, and now that it's 2019. And I, so I wonder if what people are criticizing millennials for, right, being coddled, if we're not actually doing that to our kids on a large scale. Uh, Cause that's where I see it more than what I experienced. I see it more in the parenting style of some of the millennials that I know. And it might be the great way to do it. I don't know. But um, I see it a lot. And yeah, anyways, I'm, I think I'm digressing now. But I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of wrapping this up soon, if that's okay, okay. with you. Yeah, of course. Okay. But I really wanted to touch on, and in a way, it's going back to the beginning. Um, but I really, really wanted to touch on, let's see, where is it? Uh, um, yeah. So a bit more about vulnerability. I'm going to read a quote. She says, vulnerability 
isn't just the center of hard emotions, which is what we've been talking about. It's the core of all emotions. To feel is to be vulnerable. It's the cradle of the emotions we crave, love, belonging, and joy. I think that's so beautiful and so true. I... I've noticed in myself, and she talks, she talks, and she, I, I noticed, I've been noticing a pattern in myself that then I read her writing about, right? So I was like, ah, this is so great. But I noticed that when I am with something or someone that I love, like very, very much, and it, it's some, there's a, like, it's a magical moment where I'm like experiencing joy, right? Which is this very rich rich emotion, I almost instantly do a 180 and, and feel sorrowful. That there seems to be this connection, like, like that joy in a way is, like I, I just go to losing what I love so much that's brought me that joy. So I'll often like catastrophize them dying in my head, right? And then like my joy is killed and now I'm just grieving a future moment. And she calls that foreboding joy. And I just, I loved that that's a thing. And it's like, I love that she humanized that for me and that she could explain it. That, oh gosh, okay, there's a quote here. Uh, where I hope I wrote it down. Mm -hmm. um, I will find it. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I think a lot of us. Oh, there it is. And so, and, and it really does get in the way. And it's what I, going back to talking about the wiring in our brains about um, not allowing foreboding joy to really overtake because that's what's feeding those new yeah. heads about having more of a happiness highway up in our brain. And yeah. And that allows us and then to resonate. Yeah. Them, but yes. Yeah. So in other words, it makes sense that the joy is hijacked because right. we have this very strong mechanism in our brain. Of protection, yes. Yeah. So she says that when we feel joy, it is a place of incredible vulnerability. It's mm -hmm. beauty and fragile, fragility and deep gratitude and impermanence all wrapped up in one experience. When we can't tolerate that level of vulnerability, joy actually becomes foreboding. So in other words, joy is this very rich experience. It's one of the reasons I think the richness is why it's a penultimate emotion, right? Um, but yeah, and like if we can't tolerate that yet, like if we don't have the neural pathway to lean into joy as a vulnerable experience, then we we fall back on the norm of protecting or catastrophizing and you know basically preventing myself from feeling that joyful vulnerability. Because again, the way I read the. Uh, Hardwired happiness is if I have the joy, I'm not looking around the corner for yeah. lying to eat. Yeah, yeah. Well, we don't have that in our lives anymore. No, no, we don't. And so that's not the way our culture and our lives are. Yeah. So now it is not protecting us like it was before. Now it was, it's impeding our life. It's protecting us yeah. so much. It puts up shields. It puts up all those barriers yep. that, um, yeah. that we're all searching for. And yeah, so it's that allowance of the recognition. What I what I try to do is, when I start having those thoughts, those like foreboding joy, I try to recognize it as early mm -hmm. as I can, like kind of acknowledge it. Like, why am I having this and whatever, yeah. and then try to let that, like you said, that joy feeling just flow through my my entire body and like yeah. resonate within that because yeah. they don't happen all the time. Because you know happiness. She writes about happiness as that fleeting, you know, mm -hmm. a, a piece of chocolate cake or whatever, those kind of no. things. But wait, the joys and those deep ones, they don't happen every day and all the no. time. Because that's the really deep connection that we're all seeing. Yeah. And then there we are trying to pull it apart. Yeah. Yeah. And I noticed, like, this happened a lot over the holidays, right? Because I was with the people that I love so much. And I know it, and especially around like my nieces and my nephew. And what I noticed happening is when I made that switch to fear, right? Um, I, and I literally went into like a grief experience. Right. I was no longer playful, right. right? I could no longer laugh or tell jokes and right. engage with them. And I realized my brain was 
taking away the very moment that I was afraid to lose, afraid of losing. And so I walked away with that really wanting a solution. And what I ended up finding on my own, which I was thrilled because it ends up being what Brene Brown says to do, which is to practice gratitude. So when I, I, I have that feeling with my dog a lot. (laughs) So when I'm like, he just brings me so much joy. And then I'm instantly going, Oh God, you're not going to live as long as I'm going to live. Blah, 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 blah. I like just sit and I'm, and I start to cry or whatever. I just now focus on, Oh, I'm whatever I can genuinely be grateful for in the moment. Like I love the feel of your fur, you know, your whiskers tickle or whatever. And my sadness doesn't go away. But it's, it's, it's like it can still be there. And at the same time, I can still feel connection. I can still feel love. I don't really get back to joy yet. But I think that that gratitude may be the practice that helps us rewire the brain. Yes, it is. It is. You're exactly right. And gratitude is, when I read her stuff, it's every time she has like a solve, it's about yeah. gratitude. Yes. <laughs> because we're not in it. And yeah. And it, tapped in for yourself what i hear is mm-hmm. that that practice to keep the practice going because mm-hmm. it, you will get back yeah yeah i think so too and i mean the beautiful thing is is it's 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 practical mm-hmm. it's immensely doable it doesn't have to be perfect and it's it brought me back to the present moment That's with right. my nieces and my nephew and my dog right like it gave me back that precious precious thing that we have which is the moment Right. Being present, being yeah. authentic, allowing yourself to feel. Yeah. yeah, it's it's all of it. It's a great vulnerability practice. Yeah, it is. Um, Brought that up. Gratitude is, is the key. Yeah. I, I guess just one more point, Tom, if you're if you have sure. time for it. Of course. Um she talks I, I, I guess I just want to leave people because we've outlined all these kinds of reasons why to lean into vulnerability. Uh, so I think we're gonna have some people doing it. And I want to set them up for success. So I wanted to talk just a little bit about how to choose the people we share our stories with, right? And then Brene goes into that. She says, keep like on a piece of paper, like a small group of people that you can tell your story to. In other words, don't go out and become, you know, vulnerable, emotional, vomiting on everybody. Not everybody is trustworthy. Um... But when you're feeling shame and you're in that moment of, of heavy fear, they're like, you can be vulnerable in a way that's also safe. So if you would like to add anything to that or just second it, clarify it. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you what I do is it's, it's, I don't always use just one person for all of it or just mm-hmm. at least two people for all of it. Sometimes I'll like use my brother for like my ineptitude about home repairs. And I use <laughs> my emotional as my friend over here and she helps me with that emotional. Yeah. And I use my dad for some family stuff or whatever. I mean, so sometimes it's just, I don't look for just one or two people. I, mm-hmm. I you know, sometimes in a way I kind of spread it around mm-hmm. based upon my level of trust and how I really know them. And like, I just had dinner with a, my buddy from college. We've known each other like 35 years. So we were just sitting there talking about, and I talk to him about different things than I do with my, you know, my other friend. But you know, I just don't share that part. But I'll mm-hmm. share other things that mm-hmm. I don't share. So mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I, I just kind of spread it around. Yeah. And I, and the, the key is that trust, right? And then, and and I know, I I tr- I have to trust myself mm-hmm. that I understand who I'm across from that mm-hmm. I'm gonna. I'm willing to do this. And sometimes I'll even label it. I'll say, well, I hope you can um, not share this piece. Mm-hmm. If that's a, you know, mm-hmm. kind of like when we get taught in coaching to ask permission and things, but I'll ask, uh, mm-hmm. could you n- maybe not share this or whatever before I divulge? Mm-hmm. Here, mm-hmm. Your agreement to that mm-hmm. sometimes helps if I want to go there or not. And, and then it helps them understand where the level of what we're trying, the boundaries in a way, of what we're yeah. talking about. Is this going to go on social media or is it just going to be between you and I? Can yeah. You, now, and I'll think about it in those terms or work within that stuff. Yeah. And so, um, you know, because I'll take my re- own responsibility with the conversation. If I'm divulging something, I need to make sure that if I'm not putting any kind of, you know, hey, I'm, I'm not looking for anybody to share this with other than with you, 
Mm -hmm. If I don't put that label on it, then I expect that it could be out there. I yeah. There. Yeah. So. yeah. Yeah. Bernay says, I think clarity is kind. Yes. Yeah. It, yeah. So in other words, you, you don't rely on just one person, which I think is great because no one person is always going to be emotionally right. prepared or available to do it. They might have something really heavy going on for themselves. And then two, that you, like you basically test the waters, like you get very clear on if there's a boundary that you need respected. And then you, you kind of like, you don't just take the whole package of your vulnerability and deliver it all at once, right? You like test it and build the vulnerability up as you go in the conversation with the person. And really building the trust. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's so wise, so wise. And she, like Brene mentions that the people that you share like your most vulnerable, like the full stories with, ideally are people who love you unconditionally, That's right. right? That aren't going to be shaming you or blaming you or judging you. Um, so hopefully we all have some people in our lives that are like that. If not, you will. Once you start living vulnerably, you'll find them. That's right. So. They, they can't get to the depth unless you're willing to go to the depth. Right? Exactly. Exactly. Do it together. Yeah. Yeah. That's the trust part and the yep. working together part. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, this has been, I've loved this, Tom. Oh, me too. Yeah, thank you. Anything else you want to add? No, i just uh, honored that you asked me. I love the perspective of, uh, of uh, maybe a male within Brene Brown's work. Yeah. And, and a male perspective from vulnerability. Uh, yeah. Unique, and I think it's uh, well needed within um, yeah. in our lives anymore. So thank you. Everybody. Yeah, this this stream was definitely more credible for having a male voice. <laughs> so I, I shows up. Right? Yeah. I'm looking at the drawing of the king behind you. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. It's my daughter when she was little and she supposedly it's me. <laughs> it up that day or something. Oh that's awesome. Yeah, that's so yeah. great. Well, thank you so much. Have a lovely time on your yoga retreat.